Okay. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jiffy Chen. I'm one of the organizers for GPG Boulder, and this is Chris, the other organizer. So we just going to do a little bit of uh, announcement before we go into the feature talk. So think first, silent your phone. We're with you. I always forget otherwise. Um, and every time I go through the call of conduct, because it is important, so pay attention, even though you've heard it many times already. Um, so GTG Boulder aims to be an inclusive space, meaning that you can discriminate against anyone, including but not limited to uh, gender, gender identity, religion, body shape, anything else. So if there's anything that makes you uncomfortable or you see something that you think is inappropriate, please let us know. We can introduce ourselves to you how we look like. Um, and then with that, uh, very happy that everybody is here. So, how many of you have never been to GDG Boulder? Yay, welcome. Uh, how do you feel about us? I'm always curious. You were searching for fun, you were searching for system. Android? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so usually the way we run this is it's a, just a place for the community to share with each other. What we know. So all the speakers are from the community. So if you have anything that you would like to tell other people, please let us know. It doesn't have to be a cool feature talk to be a five minute you know, little show and tell. Or I, I'm going to do a demo right after him. So it's not like a talk with slides or it's a variety of topics. So let us know because without you, there's no meal. I don't have a magic pool of awesome people. It's the pool, right? at least from you. So let us know. Um, and with that, we're going to do some announcements. So I'm going to start with announcements, and afterwards, I'll open up so everybody who is hiring or looking for a job or has any other announcements can do it. So just start thinking. Um, so today, we have Flutter. And right afterwards, on Saturday, we don't usually do like you know, back to back like that. But on Saturday, we're partnering with uh, GDG Northern Colorado to do one on Google Actions, um, Google Assistant. Doesn't really ring a bell when I first heard about it. Basically, Google Home. Who has a Google Home here? All right, great. So I will not say the keyword, but then you know how you say the keyword, and then it will do something. So we're going to have two events actually. So uh, on Saturday, we're going to have a kickoff event uh, where you will see a bunch of information on how do you write in a new action, a custom action, and then we'll go through a collab together so that we can have like, one sample going. And then during the week, you will go do it on your own with a team that you form. And of course, you know, if, if during uh, Saturday we have more time, we'll do that as well. Um, the idea being then that way you can just do it at your own time rather than have a 24-hour hackathon and not sleep. Like I, I like sleeping. Um, so it's a hackathon, but with a twist. So we actually you just do it at home. And also because it's voice controlled, if you have 30 people in the room all trying to talk and keep up, that may be complicated. So it's a slight different situation. And then the week after on the 30th, we'll all come back and we'll, we'll do presentations and prizes. And so Jen and Eden, are our partners are from uh, Northern Colorado. This time we're running in Loveland. And what is the prize, Jen? Uh, we will have a Google Home and a Google Home Mini and possibly some other small things. Sure, the grand would be Yeah, so no guarantee because I actually have a Google Daydream at home, but I don't know where it is. If I can find it before the 30th, <laughs> like it will be in the prices. Um, I got a bunch last year and like, I was trying to give it out, but a lot of people don't have compatible phones, so and I stash it away from there. But I'll throw that into the prize pool as well, but I just forgot where it is. Um, so that's it. Um, July, I right now don't have anything scheduled yet. I may, if people like the demo that I give, I may give a full-length talk, but you have to convince me because I don't have to make the talk. Um, and that's it. So I'm opening it up. So is there, is there anyone here who's hiring? All right. Let everybody, uh, tell, tell everybody your name. And then sure. You hiring? Uh, my name is Charlie, and the company I work for is Training Peaks. Uh, we make software that helps athletes and coaches uh, compete in endurance events. So if that's something you're interested in, um, come see me after the talk. We are hiring iOS devs and Android devs. Uh, we're actually probably, probably hiring maybe two or three 
Android devs right now. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else hiring? Yes. Yeah. And both companies are based in Boulder? Yeah, yeah, we're on the north side of Boulder. Okay. Hey, anybody else hiring? Anybody else want to be hired? Looking for a job. Well, my name is Bob Heitz, and uh, I've been doing uh, real time embedded control software for a good number of years. Predominantly in C, but also in C. Uh, the past two weeks, I've been uh, working on Flutter. Oh, all right. <laughs> Flutter! Nice. I don't know if anyone's hiring for Flutter yet, but <laughs> you never know. Great. Anybody else? General announcements? And also meet up with the new restaurant, um, you know, <laughs> some, some other thing you're doing, some, you know, face painting at the, at the Thomas Market. And if you see with an iPhone that you will hold it up, but the guys who are running the Rocky Mountain Angular meetup in Denver are putting on a three day Angular conference. I think that's the first major conference Angular. Oh. I believe that's in August, maybe close to the second week or so. AngularDenver.com. Great. That reminds me of my conference. I was giving out stickers. Who hasn't gotten one yet? All right. So uh, pass it down. Down. Uh, so I forgot also to introduce Dave, our Google host. Uh, you need to come up because you're wearing our t-shirt, so people oh, need to see it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we run an Android conference called 360 and Dev. Um, and if you have a sticker, look at it. It says July 19th to 20th. So it's coming up in four weeks, meaning soon. Uh, there is an excellent Android conference, if I may say so myself. Actually, there are people in the audience who have been there, so you can ask them about it. Um, it's our third year running, and it's been great just uh, bringing in speakers from all over the place. and having a place where we can learn from each other. So please buy some tickets. You need to get those tickets selling because if the same reality is running a conference is not really a money making business, but we at least need to break even. And I think it has been really good in terms of, at least the people who attended thought it was a really good thing for people to learn and just network and figure out you know, how to hire people or get hired or like up the next project if you have something that you're not sure how to do maybe somebody else has done it already and you can pay tips and tricks so 360andep.com uh i feel like i'm a salesman on the tv or something <laughs> don't wait <laughs> because it's really amazing like this is probably going to be the, the one meet up before the actual conference so it's really happening. I've been I've been talking about this for months now, but it is happening. So uh, let me know if you have any questions. But most of the information is on the website already. Okay. This year's T-shirt is even better than this one too. <laughs> yeah, we we saw the previous graphics. That's right. Yeah. All right. So that was a long stream of announcements. Sorry to I have you just stand Sorry. here. Um, I will let you introduce yourself and take it from here. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tyler. I'll be giving this talk on Flutter, um, which I have titled Cross Platform Development for the Mobile Kind rather than the Web Developer Kind, because that's what most of them are. Um, so, a little bit about myself. I'm Tyler, as I said, um, I'm an Android developer at a company called Blinker. Uh, we're based out of Denver. Um, for those who don't know, it's a mobile app, basically, and website now to help people buy and sell cars to each other as well as finance. Um, I've been building Android apps for about five years. I did some stuff in college at CU Boulder, um, but more professionally for five years. Um, and I've been a Flutter enthusiast for about five months since uh, Dark Conf, I streamed it. Um, and I did the Kessel Run in 13 parsecs, so just edged out by Han Solo. Anyways, um, so if we want to go look into the Dart programming language, for those of you who don't know about Flutter, um, it is 
all of the, the language you use is Dart. Um, Google's own language created a while ago. I think it was 2011 was when it was first announced. Um, but we'll kind of just go through a little bit of the syntax of Dart itself. Um, so I base this off of Kotlin versus Dart rather than Java. If you're an Android developer and you're not using Kotlin, I hope you switch soon. Um, it's great. But uh, you can see a couple differences. Um, sorry to those of you who aren't coders, but um, we've got constructors. Uh, you can see you actually reference any final variables or also optional ones um, in the constructor itself. Um, access level modifiers, this is a really interesting thing to me, but whenever you're creating a private variable, you prepend the name with an underscore, which I guess exists in a couple other languages, but it's bizarre and interesting to get used to. Um, interfaces, the, the name interface doesn't actually exist in Flutter or in Dart. Um, you actually just create an abstract class done. Um, and then shorthanding looks a lot like Colin, except with a caret. You notice that all of these things do have the semicolon. It's coming back. Uh, <laughs> and then cascading notation, basically. So you create a constructor, and then you can reference its variables and instantiate them, just like you would with the apply function or various other things in Colin. Um, oh, and I meant to say I will, I'll have a coding session uh, a little bit later to dive into this more for any questions, and then at the very end I'll have a general question for Flutter and everything else. Um, so we can go through a few fun facts about Dart. It was created jointly by Lars Bach and Casper Lund, um, which Lars Bach has done a lot of things, so they both have, um, but most notably created Chrome's V8 uh, JavaScript engine, um, but both of them have done a lot of things with virtual machines, um, particularly around object-oriented language. Um, so Dart has what's known as a tree-shaking compiler. Um, you can kind of think of it as being like ProGuard. It gets rid of your dependencies, except for it works well. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it basically just cleans up anything that you don't need. Um, there is a Dart virtual machine version of Chromium back from when Google decided they were going to try to push Dart as kind of the replacement of JavaScript. They didn't say that. Those are my words. Um, but uh, they still ship a version of Chromium with the Dart VMs that you can build uh, native Dart web apps. Um, influenced by languages like StrongTalk, Erlang, Ruby, C Sharp, et cetera, et cetera. Um, has a concept called isolates, which is similar to the Erlang actor model for uh, memory management, um, concurrency, and security. Uh, there are mixins, which is something kind of new to me personally. Um, using methods from other classes, it's kind of like composition, but you don't actually have to have inheritance through that class. Um, and it's an algorithmic language, nothing too shiny there. All right, so with a little bit of Dart there, we can go into the actual Flutter framework. Um, so Flutter is another cross-platform SDK, another, another framework for creating cross-platform apps. There's been a lot of these, um, most notably React Native, Xamarin, Cordova, formerly PhoneGap. Um, and so Flutter is basically trying to solve the same problem as them, right? You've got two different development teams, which you know, you're know you clearly near dear to your heart since you've had iOS experience, you have to switch over to Android. Um, but being able to have a single code base and creating native feeling iOS and Android apps. Um, Flutter does have a few advantages, which we'll go over here. Um, so native app development, you probably know. Basically, on this side, you've got any hardware, sensors, et cetera, specific to the phone. You've got your app over here running native code, be it you know, Objective-C or Swift or Java. Um, and then you've got widgets that ship with the platform itself, um, which can differ from you know, Samsung to LG and whatnot better now, but it's still kind of a pain. And then you've got your canvas for actually rendering. Um, so advantages of native app development, you've got really quick performance, obviously. You can't beat native. Um, you get direct access to hardware interfaces, as you can see from that little arrow there. Um, platforms are providing native widgets, um, which this is kind of a downfall. This has been a problem with Android in the past before material design you know, specific 
OEMs creating different views and whatnot, which end up causing a lot of problems for web or app developers. Um, so there is this other concept. This is not really commonly used anymore, but web view app development. Um, this is actually what Apple did before creating native apps in Objective-C a um, long time ago, but that's what they used to do. So views are basically just built in a web view. And you've got your code and your app running in JavaScript with this bridge in order to access any hardware, sensors, et cetera. Um, and that bridge is a slowing point. Keep that in mind for the, the next one. Um, works fine for just loading a website, basically, but in an app, it's really just a web view in an app. Um, but anything beyond that doesn't work out that great. Um, then you've got something that became more popular, React Native. Um, you get this reactive web app development that basically looks and feels native, minus a little bit of lagginess, um, but was created for web developers, which there are a lot of. Um, so you could use something like JavaScript. But again, you have this bridge here where every single time, say you're trying to drag across the screen, You've got input coming from the screen, going to your app through this bridge once. Then it goes back through the bridge in order to render it. And it keeps going back and forth. So any sort of thing where you actually need feedback um, can be limited quite a bit. Um, this isn't as big of a problem now, because phones are a lot faster. But it's still, a, still noticeable. Um, so it does use OEM widgets. You don't have to create all of them yourself. Uh, it does have a reactive architecture, which is also really popular in Redux. Whatnot. Um, and you get, uh, this is exactly what I said with hardware inputs, UI gestures that can be a little bit laggy. Um, same story there. And it requires multiple view implementations for Android and iOS, unless you want them to look the exact same, which hopefully you don't. Depends, but still. So we can go into Flutter and talk about where its advantages lay. Um, so Again, we've got a similar thing, but the widgets and rendering is happening all in the app, essentially. Um, it does inflate your app a bit. But all of the widgets are created in Dart. So they come with the, fl the framework itself. Um, and there are, I'll talk on this more later, but they have them um, for material design as well as Cupertino. Uh, and then you get access to the hardware based on these things called platform channels. Um, so it doesn't rely on OEM widgets. All of them come with Flutter, which sounds like it could be a scary thing, but they actually work really well. Um, it supports both ahead of time compilation and just in time compilation. And that's something that Xamarin is kind of a little more noticeable for, is you can get ahead of time compilation. It makes it a more faster app, uh, more or less. But then the just in time compilation helps for development cycles and oh, well, I just need to change this one thing, but my app is huge, and I have to wait you know, 10 minutes for it to compile. Um, and that works for both Android and iOS. Um, and it has something called design-driven development, which I haven't heard of anywhere else. But basically, you're focusing on the experience. And because Flutter was built to work in 60 frames per second for every single app that you create, it is a very design-driven development process. You focus on the, Develop or designers, at least at our company, have been really excited about Flutter and the little demos that I've showed them. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions about it. So their philosophy is that everything is a widget, um, except for Keanu Reeves. But uh, so I kind of put together this little idea to kind of tell you what that means. Because to me, at least for a while, I don't think I fully understood everything is a widget. Because some things aren't widgets. Um, so here's a little basic thing. Build a text view centered and padded with a green rounded corner background. Um, I just made this up. But so that little view there is what we're trying to create. So in Android, the way you do it is you make the base layout, you put in a text view, and within that text view, you'd add a bunch of attributes like padding and actual textile, as well as um, the background. Uh, and the gravity of it. So you can see this is kind of, sorry if that's a little small, it's just XML for creating views in Android. Describing basically what I said on the left. Uh, in Flutter, everything is a widget. And so this is where it differs quite a bit. 
granted there'd be more overhead here, but we just took out the middle chunk. Uh, so your body is basically where everything lays in there. Uh, in order to center it, rather than having a property like gravity or center, center is a widget. So you basically are putting everything within the center widget that puts it in the center. Uh, beyond that, you've got something called a decorated box, which has multiple parameters. Um, one of them being a child. A lot of these have child. It's where you put children. It's cascading uh, long widget trees. But uh, so basically, your decorated box has a decoration. I don't actually know if that one's technically a widget, but uh, which actually has border radius. And rather than just being able to say four, you have to do border radius, all being all the corners. The radius is circular, and it's four. So it seems a bit verbose. Uh, and especially whenever you get to longer views, it can really, really be hefty. Um, but there are some ways around that with organization and whatnot. So that's basically what I mean by everything's a widget. Uh, then even down beyond here, in order to put the text in, we have to put wrap that in a padding widget. Again, it seems like a lot of widgets, and it is a lot of widgets. Um, but the way it lays out and renders everything is completely different from Android, which is why you can still get these 60 frame per second apps. Um, so there's two main concepts for widgets in Flutter. Uh, you've got stateless widgets and stateful widgets. So you can think of stateless widgets as being these lightweight widgets. They render quickly. Um, they're basically, their content is immutable. So you load something like a text view with the text itself, you're not updating it on the fly. It's just there. Um, and I also wrote icon being just a simple icon. You don't have to rebuild it because it's, it's already there. It's already been laid out. It's already done everything. Nothing, no properties of it are going to change. Um, and then you've got stateful widgets, which rebuild anytime its state has changed. So something like if you were to have a more complex view with the text inside and the text is alternating every three seconds or something, that is part of the state. Um, and you can't just set the properties. You have to call this function called set state. But I'll get more on that when I show you the demo. Um, the content is mutable, as I said. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to change. Uh, so anything that animates, you basically have to interpolate where the animation is in the process. That's why that's part of the state. Um, a text field where you're actually inputting text, that's constantly changing as well as like a slider, um, you know, you have to check the progress of it. So let's hop over to my code example. This isn't a super exciting code example, but it's there. Um, doo -doo -doo. So oh, I can't really make those bigger. That's nice. So we'll go in here to something. This is my main page. Um, you can tell it already looks a little, uh, a little daunting. Um, but more or less, uh, let me run this on the iPhone simulator. I guess, first off, you can tell I'm doing this in Android Studio, which is great because it's a wonderful IDE. Um, you can also use app code or Visual Studio code, sorry. Uh, there's a plugin for Flutter. It's natively supported. Um, do -do -do. So you can kind of see, I need to get this to actually build, but you can tell uh, some of the views that I talked about earlier where you have this body, container, a center to actually center it. Um, material is actually a special widget that is not really used for that much. It's just all of its children that use it. Um, basically, it's just a colored background. And then inkwell is kind of this special thing where you get a push button effect. See, they always tell you to compile these beforehand, and that's what I tried to do. And But I digress. Um, I'll talk about this a bit more, uh, just in terms of the general widgets. So yes, I can do that. Provided it'll actually run on an emulator. For some reason, the Android emulator, every time I try to present my screen, it just like freezes. So I just had to restart it. But then that made everything. Yeah, well, we're going to try that too. <laughs> um, okay. 
Okay. So just kind of talking about the generics of this. Actually, maybe we can run this just to show you some actual, there we go. Um, so scaffold, this very top part of this widget here, page, there's a lot of terms, but everything is a widget, so it's a widget. Um, scaffold is basically your standard, at least Android looking view. You've got the action bar, the toolbar up top, uh, and you've got this main content section in the middle, and then at the very bottom, if you want it, you can put in a floating action button. Um, there's a number of ways you can move that. You don't have to have it. But that's what's known as a scaffold. And more or less, it's kind of the basis for the majority of apps and screens you can use. Um, iOS, there is one called Cupertino Scaffold, I think. I didn't use it, but it exists. Um, and if I just open up what this was before, you should see, OK, so you can kind of tell this is the same code, but one simple difference you can see is on the iOS version, we've got our text centered in the action bar up top versus on the Android one, it's on the left. Standard, basically, just on what your design is. Um, and then another thing that's kind of fun, which granted, I don't know if it's going to work without me recompiling. There's an Android style dialog. Um, it's really big, but uh, you can tell that's another widget created, supplied exactly by Flutter as it exists. Could have made it a lot prettier. Uh, but more or less, you get things that are supplied with the platform, uh, looking native and functioning native. There's actually quite a bit of uh, performance tools in Android Studio, at least that can show you how well it's running, it shows in frames per second. You can see where any of your problems might lie, et cetera. Um, and this, this thing really doesn't want to run for me on the iPhone, at least. I don't know why. Why, though? Ugh. Oh, tech demos. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. This right there. <laughs> so it's kind of just how you architect it yourself, your app. Um, yeah, it's it's daunting, and there's not really any strict guidelines for it. I did. I've seen a number of talks that people have done on YouTube. And they show their code examples. And they basically organize things just a lot better than I did. Um, <laughs> I made this in the last couple hours. But uh, yeah, it's basically you can kind of structure things as you like. Oh, you're not really going to be able to see this that well. But in packages, so you can do a package with views, a package with pages, pages being more like activities, views being like custom views or components. Um, and you basically take any chunk that you want in here that you might duplicate. So it might even just be like that centered. Uh, oh, this, no, that's exactly what it was before. Um, like that centered text, uh, that being, you know, I want this to be a view that I'm going to reuse throughout my app. I'll create that as a view and then give it one parameter that I'm going to actually change in the text. So I've seen code that looks a lot cleaner than mine. Long story short, uh, but yeah, they they call it the the widget tree. I haven't heard it called the widget tree of doom yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> um, you can actually see with some of the tools that come with it. Although granted, it has to actually be connected, so probably. Uh, how about I just start restart ADB? Maybe. Should really make a shortcut for that. Um, you know, the thing is, it's not running for the iPhone simulator either. So, nope, but it's running. Find out. Um, but yeah, without actually having something to show you guys off of this, uh, there's a lot of tools that come here. You get this kind of outline, which basically looks at all of the 
widgets that you have in your view that you're going to be rendering, and it it'll give you any warnings that you might have on this side, um, and it kind of helps. It helps clean it up a little bit. It's not really that clean. Helps you out at least a little bit. Uh, and even from here, you can actually do some UI things like adding padding. So I can add it to that. It'll automatically do it. Um, and actually, the tools for Android Studio are pretty nice when it comes to this. So there can be things like, say, I don't want this padding anymore. Rather than you know deleting it, deleting the other line, there's a number of built-in functions. So I can just remove the widget if it does it. Um, and you can do that with wrapping with new widgets. You can do it with replacing it with one of its child widgets. There's a lot of really cool Android Studio features that you can use, um, along with Flutter. Uh, well, I'm, I'm disappointed in my uh, demo here. But I, I don't know how else to make this run, because it, it's great. OK, well, let's go back then. Actually, any questions? on the actual code itself. I know it's a little difficult with it not actually running properly, but. Sorry, what was that? Oh, yeah. These giant clumps. Um Yeah, so this function up here actually is, I made it's called git dialog. Uh, that was basically. If I could get it to run, the iPhone simulator is going to show you the difference and how they look completely native. The Cupertino dialog looks exactly like it would in iOS, it's where I created them right there. Um, and so I'm actually referencing that function within here, um, right there, and passing it just a basic padded text view. That's what this look at look at dialog thing is uh, into the method itself, that's the content, and then building the appropriate dialogue per platform. Um, it can kind of seem another hindrance where you have to duplicate everything. But with some nice dependency injection that you have to do yourself, but you've got a lot of options for it, you can pretty much just use this function that's you grab the context and you say, what's my platform I'm on right now? Uh, the options being Android, iOS, or Fuchsia. Um, and based off of that, you could inject whatever sort of views you want to use. Uh, I did it in another demo a while back. So it can look a lot cleaner than this. You can basically just use your component injector and say, get a dialog. And based on the context, it already knows which dialog to pull for which platform. Um, you have a question? Absolutely. Um, so I pulled this up. Granted, this isn't just UI. This is everything. Um, there's this really nice website. Uh, it's actually originally was for Dart, but it's kind of its own central source of truth for uh, third-party libraries and packages that you can use for Flutter. Um, there's a number of them that are UI-based. There's a number of them that are functional-based. Uh, but there are thousands of these. And they're all in one central place, which is really nice compared to Android. You have to Google search and find it and then decide. Um, but going into something like that, uh, we can click on something like the Firebase Auth plugin. And you see these numbers that are next to it. Um, this number is actually the health or the it's kind of a rating for the library itself. It's based on three factors. There's popularity, so how many people are using it? Health is like, how are the tests doing? Is it building fine? In CI, basically, and then maintenance being how often it's updated. Um, so it's really nice. Like, is there anything in particular you had in mind? I could just take a look. Um, Flutter Firebase UI, that's URL. Sprite widgets, I don't know what Chewy is. It's a video player. Um, but yeah, I mean, we've got pages of these. And it's nice that you can just look at a glance. And granted, maybe it's a bit biased, but you can decide whether or not you want to even look into using that as a framework that you might use. Um, yeah. 
And you can also do it yourself. There's a lot of, whenever you first create a Flutter project in Android Studio, it offers like, would you like to create an app? Would you like to create a plugin? Would you like to create a package? Um, and so I've actually started doing some of that just locally for myself, like referencing it and being like, oh, well, I know that I want to use this specific custom slider that I made, push it up. The community is really big, and it's growing quickly. So yeah, um, we'll go in cascade order. <laughs> Mm -hmm. No, so that would, Dart would probably be your solution for that. Um, so granted, everything in Flutter is written in Dart. So looking directly in here for things that are supported in Flutter, you've got a number of things. Um, basically, I, I mean, it kind of depends on what you would need for actually interacting with it in an app, or if this is literally just an app for connecting sockets base or something. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, I haven't looked much at the background processing, honestly, um, in terms of what you might need for like a service rather than a full UI-based app. Um, but you've got a number of different Dart frameworks that can do that for you. Uh, and I would presume run the background on either Android or iOS. Um, and kind of the nice thing with that, too, is Dart works really well with web. I mean, that's what it was originally designed for. And so if you're basically abstracting the UI from the Dart code itself, you can actually cover three platforms. You get the web as well as Android and iOS. And then you just plug into the Flutter views or whatever you might need for iOS and Android. It transpiles, yes, it can, but it also compiles into its own binaries. No, it's creating its own binary. It's got its own compiler, and yeah, then it would be an extra layer for that JavaScript bridge that would <laughs> make it even slower. Um, yeah. You also said something about the designers. So for one thing, speed, uh, we did a hackathon. It was like a two and a half day hackathon at work. Um, and our designers tend to be thinking very forward. You know, they design all these things, they put them up on Zeppelin. We look at them and we say, hey, that's really cool. But you know, with our process, it's going to take forever to get to it. And so being that I, I specifically took something that they made, it was like a price slider. <laughs> I don't know if I actually have that running on the simulator or not, but uh, uh, I might actually. You can pretend something happened. Oh, no, that's actually hooked up. Um, see if I can actually do something here for you. OK, yeah, I screwed that up, but there. Um, So this view right here was something that designers had been wanting for a while. I was able to build this in maybe an afternoon, which I've been an Android developer for a while, and I would not feel confident getting that done in that amount of time. Um, and the best thing about it is it works on both platforms. So yeah. Um, and again, being that everything's design driven, everything runs in 60 frames a second. So it's, you know, it's hard to tell on an emulator running casting on a screen, but it's really smooth. Um, yeah, and they've been really excited about that. Um, there are a couple more in the back. So Flutter itself, at least I can show you a little bit here with how they have it set up. Um, because of the stateful and stateless widgets, you've got this concept of setting your state, and this is it's hard to call it an MVC pattern, but it's kind of relevant. Uh, so you've got this set state function, and that's actually where you would update any of your variables. Um, so I, I don't even remember what I was trying to set here. Oh yeah, this is so. This is actually me um, updating to show that dialog. 
it's a simple thing and it really shouldn't be happening in the same code as the rest of the UI, but they call it a basic one. Aside from that, um, Flutter Redux is a real thing. Uh, I think one of the bigger developers of Redux uh, is actually spearheading that. I can't remember his name. Uh, Brian Egan. I think he's pretty big in that web developer world. But um, that's an option. There's Flux is another library for doing basically any sort of state, stateful update um, based off of Facebook's Flux, which I think this is kind of losing popularity. But there's a number of options. Um, any of the the sort of view model that you might be creating, a view or whatever, uh, they'd probably be written solely in Dart. They would have no dependency on Flutter, at least if you're developing it with that kind of uh, cohesion in mind or decoupling in mind. Um, and then that's another case where actually the, the model, the presenter, whatever controller, there's so many different architectures, um, could actually be shared across Android, iOS, and web, because web could be using something like Angular Dart or another framework in order to build their UI. So I don't know how well that answers your question. But <laughs> um, can you do one? Uh, yes. Yes, but it's not very feasible. <laughs> um, so this kind of, I'll see if I can show you a little bit of just how everything is laid out in the project itself. It's hard to tell because I can't make that bigger. Um, but so you basically got all your dark code in this library package. And then above that, you've got an iOS package and an Android package. And the Android package itself is basically just an Android app. Um, it's pretty simple. All it really has is like a main activity. And then it references everything else through platform channels in Dart. Um, but more or less, if you wanted to add a Flutter UI to your Android app, you would have to wrap your entire project in Flutter and have your app be right there, essentially. And then you use something, I think it's like a Flutter view. It's an Android component that you can actually use. Um, from what I understand, Google's working to make that better. Because yeah, as it exists today, it didn't seem very feasible. Um, it can work, but it's not really a sustainable approach yet. So, yeah. A bit, yeah. I was gonna. I really ran out of time in order to give a good demo for today, and especially because it's not even building. Um, but yeah, I have looked a bit in the cover teams and whatnot. Um, there is also RX Dart. RX is near and dear to my heart, <laughs> and RX Dart is the solution for that as well. Um, did you have any particular questions about the async stuff? Or? Um, I've been trying to figure out how well it's, 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 it's not intuitive to parallel the same thing that you're doing. Totally. <laughs> no, I understand what you mean. Yeah, OK, awesome. Good. I was like, I have basic stuff, but it's not very good. So <laughs> yeah, we can have Chiki go over that. Um, there's another question back there. OK. No, <laughs> um, we've been around for a few years. So even before Flutter was announced in alpha, we'll see. I'm pushing for it. Um, because of our hackathon, actually, our higher ups were really excited about the app that we made. And we had, I don't know, we'd rank our hackathon endings for some reason. But our team came in second, which was kind of cool. Um, Andy was a part of that. But yeah. Um, I'm going to move along. I do have another section for questions, but just going to finish up. I've got a couple more slides for you. Um, OK, so just kind of talking about some of the drawbacks and concerns. Uh, Flutter is young. That's pretty well known. It was announced in alpha, I think, at last year's Google I.O., something around that time. So it's really new. Um, granted, as of, I think, literally yesterday, the release preview won. 1.0 was announced um, and shown. So it's really getting close to that initial 1.0 stage. Um, it did go into beta back in February, I think. Um, yeah, and so it's, 
it's getting really close to a 1.0 release, which is really exciting. <clears throat> um, here's kind of a downfall that might upset some people, might not bother you as much, depending on what your app is going to do. It does inflate the binaries. Because all of the views and components are built in Dart, it basically has to ship with them. And so it inflates your binary roughly six megs. At least their most basic app that they did an example of was around six megs. Um, some of that might have been your Java code deck stuff, but yeah. Um, the Flutter version of Dart that it ships with does not support reflection, which means there is no JSON. JSON parsing is really sad. Um, I don't know what what the future of this looks like, but I'm hoping something comes along. Because as of right now, you pretty much have to use annotation processing in order to parse any JSON in any feasible way to get it into a model more quickly. Um, and there's a lot of code gen involved with that. Um, staying up to date with platform APIs. So not as concerning with Android, considering it's all Google. But when it comes to things like iOS, uh, any new API that iOS might create, it's going to be community driven. So it's going to be the community. Maybe there are some people at Google working on it. I don't know. But if they want to make that functional in Flutter, you know, Apple's not going to do the work to make it work with Flutter. So someone else has to. Um, and then common question, is it stable enough? Is it actually going to take off? Kind of a success story. Some of you might have heard of the Hamilton app. Um, so Hamilton being this really big musical that's been around I don't know, roughly a year, maybe less than that. Um, huge throughout the United States. Uh, it was built by a company called Posse. They're based out of New York. Um, they kind of, they're, they're a mobile app development company, and they traditionally do native apps. Um, but when it came to Hamilton, and they were contracted to do it, they kind of took a leap of faith and went ahead and just built it in Flutter. It took them three months to build the entire app, which includes these lotteries in order to get tickets. Uh, it has like a whole kind of social aspect to it. Um, there's a lot of functionality in it. And it's not a bad app. I mean, the ratings have been over four stars on both the Google Play Store and the App Store, Apple App Store. Um, I can't even keep track of how many installs it has, but it's a few million. I think they had something like 500,000 daily active users. It's, it's big. Um, and out of anyone that they've interviewed about it, nobody has realized but it's not a native app. It feels native, and they're impressed with it. So there's a success story. They have a lot of other things on their website. They have a whole blog talking about their process. Um, any more questions before we jump into Juki's demo? I'm curious, is there a mapping solution yet? Mapping from? Like, can you get to Google Maps? Oh, I think so. This is another one of those things where I just go here and look it up. Um, Map view plugin for Google Maps, 98 health. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Google has provided a ton of things with like Firebase. I think there's even a TensorFlow thing in here. There's a number of things that they provided that are all already built because Google's been using Dart itself for a while. Um, I didn't bring it up in there, but actually their AdWords platform, you know, one of their biggest monetizers entirely, uh, was rebuilt a year or a couple years ago or so, completely in Dart. So you can tell that they're investing in it. And they've provided a number of things here. So. Um, Directly in? No. Well. Yeah, it would be janky. It'd kind of be in the same situation as trying to create a Flutter view for an Android project. Um, yeah, it, it, it wouldn't be fun. <laughs> I'll say that. So. Granted, tic-tac-toe isn't really visually heavy, I guess. Um, but sure, no, I was trying to think. Uh, there's actually, Flutter is built with this uh, 2D rendering engine built in called Skia. Um, 
And so you actually get some really nice performance. There is one of the demo apps that someone put up on Medium is actually 2048. And so it has all those animations and everything. And it, it, it's, it, they built it in a day, I think. Um, a simple tic-tac-toe app, I mean, the most your effort you're going to put in is for the logic itself. The UI is so quick and easy to make. Um, and I, in my experience, at least, it's been kind of an exponential learning experience. It started off slow, and then it's just ramped up. The more I do with it, the quicker I learn it, and even more so than I have with Android. So that's been really fun. It can be really frustrating to begin with, especially for anyone who doesn't know Dart, because the syntax and some quirkiness here. But once you get over that, it really goes quick. So. You mean like kind of like the drag and drop types style or something? There is so only third party based, um, which I would really like to have because that's one of the things I love about Android is you can even, I never do the drag and drop, but I write it in XML and I can see it live updating. Um, someone created something, I think it's called Flutter Studio. This was a, just someone who decided to make it and they made a second version of it recently. Maybe this is it. Uh, that's not it, that's the old version. But they basically created this kind of drag and drop uh, web app for, I think that's it, for like, dropping in, building UIs based in that. Um, you can pretty much customize everything that you want in there. And then it actually, you can go into the source code and just copy paste it. So, yeah. The navigation? Oh, I gotcha. Um, so that's what that scaffold is. The scaffold in and of itself provides, or at least builds out a framework for this thing called an app bar, which that's the action uh, action bar, toolbar. There's been a bunch of names for it. Um, but then it basically has things like title being the general title there. There should be uh, uh, actions. There you go. So I think actions being uh, um, icons dot plus. Those are going to be like your icons that you put in the top. Um, I don't actually know what the uh, the back button is called, but it's there. I know that. Um, so yeah, actually, the the amount of widgets that are provided and the things you kind of have to get used to it and actually figure out what they're called. <laughs> um, but a lot of it's there. A, a lot, a lot of it's there. I am not 100% sure. Um, well, so those are the actual, these are the libraries that you use that's basically like your dependencies. Was that what you were asking? No. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, I gotcha. Sorry, I I misinterpreted that entirely. <laughs> sure, everything that I used in there it was packaged into Flutter. Um, Cupertino icons is one that you can see right here. That's just the icons. The actual Cupertino widgets for like the dialogue. They have like a bottom modal sheet. They've got their buttons, um, which if it was working on the iPhone simulator, I would have showed you. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything else is provided in Flutter. The, the amount of widgets that are in there is kind of insane, which I think is why it inflates the binary so much. Um, yeah, literally the only thing I added in here from the base app when you first created is Rx Dart, which isn't even a Flutter package. It's just a Dart package. So yeah, the widgets itself, uh, I don't have an actual metric on how many there are, but it's a lot. Yeah, the uh, Flutter... Flutter IO has a number of things that it's constantly, the documentation is constantly getting updated. Um, they've got showcases. These are some of the apps that are actually using Flutter. Um, but the widget catalog is more so what I was looking at. So you can do basics. Um, and they're constantly updating these icons. So you actually tell what they are. 
but so these are just the basics and then you get things more complicated painting and effects there is a canvas um but yeah there's there's a really nice ui actually for looking into it and seeing all of the widgets that are available anyone else for this demo better demo <laughs> all right Excuse me. So, inception in here for the So, I still need to set this up. Okay, so I took notes about all the other questions that people ask. I'll try to um, focus on the part that people have questions I can demonstrate with this app. But first, let me give you some background of what this app is. Uh, okay, so um, essentially what happened was I have a friend that started this three years ago uh, to help people get more involved with voting. So it's like a specific app. Uh, but she got as far as user study and the prototype. It didn't actually was available. Um, and then I was like, well, you know, I've always wanted to have a chance to write a photo app. Um, so I decided to go ahead and implement it. Um, so the idea is that it uses the Google Civic Information API, which lets you, given an address, it will query and see what district you're in. So for example, if you're in Boulder, then you are in Colorado and in Congressional District 2, I believe and so on. And then during election time, it will also give you your polling station information and candidates and whatnot. Um, so I decided I want to learn Flutter and Firebase at the same time because I like jumping on the deep end of the pool. Um, but also that the reason why I'm interested in Flutter is two things. One, the fact that the state and the UI are separated. Um, it's very appealing to me because I'm very big in testing. So you. In my head, it's like, well, you have a state, and then you transition to another state, and then the UI updates. I haven't gone to that part yet. I've done this for maybe 20 days now. But the other part is I'm very interested in learning how to think in streams. Because I've tried RxJava, and sorry, I know people love RxJava, but I could not understand RxJava. It's just very difficult. Um, so I want to try it in Flutter, because Flutter has built in um, async away and also streams. So I'll show that as well. Um, I actually grasped it very quickly in, in Bash, so there is hope. And I'm hoping that that will translate to Kotlin coroutines as well. It sounds very familiar. So I'm going to show that, that part first uh, because I'm very excited about that. And before I forget, I'm just going to show you. Um, everything is actually on GitHub, so if people are interested, um, I can post a link to the meetup um, so people can check it out. But disclaimer, because this is me learning to swim by jumping in the deep end of the pool, I don't know whether I'm doing anything right. In fact, listening to Tyler's talk, I realized that some of my widgets shouldn't be stateful. They should be stateless. So I'll probably go back and change them. I don't know why they're stateful. I think it's because the demo app I used for uh, Firebase was stateful, and that was it. So I'll just copy and paste it over. Um, but it does go, I, I went through a lot of things. I was like, how do I do it? And, oh, so I, you, can, you can have an example of how do you do like retrofit style uh, fetching from the internet and Passing JSON into objects, for example. But that's something I'm, I think is the right thing to do. So let's jump into code and demo at the same time. Uh, so uh, I'm already logged in, so you don't see the login screen, but the login is just using Firebase off. So I literally have a button that says sign in with Google, you click on it, and then you choose your account. It's um, very pleasant because I don't have to do anything. So now I have signed in, but I haven't provided my address yet. So I'm going to type in something. Um, and I have some sample here so that it's, uh, when I develop, I don't have to actually type things in. But I don't have one for Boulder, so I'll type in the Boulder one because I think it's more interesting when you see something where you are. So 
before I click on it, I'm going to show it on Firebase as well. So Firebase is a real-time database, and the way the app um, I have it hooked up is when you have a user input, it actually writes to the Firebase somewhere where I call triggers, um, and then that makes something happen in Firebase Cloud Function to process the information and then come back and write it to another position, and then the app listens to it in a stream. So this may not make any sense if you haven't done it before, so hopefully I can walk you through. So when I click look up, um, it does this search thing. So what this does right now is that, of course I'm demoing so it doesn't work. Come on, come on, okay. So now I have created a user under the user collection, and in the trigger, it writes it into this place called address, which is the one that you can see here. Um, and then on Firebase, um, I don't have the code up. So on the cloud function, what it does is, you know what, this is not what it does. Hold on. I told you I haven't prepared this. So what, I'm going to show you the code is easier. So what happens is when I have that form, I type in the address, then here in the address input um, screen, that means the same thing that Tyler showed, I have this I scaffold and have an app bar. It updates the user by writing it to, uh, well, it deletes the old election information if there's any, just to clear out because it may or may not correspond to the same address. And then it writes to the collection of the user, which um, I use it all the time, so I have a helper function. And the way you make your code like less, like, that cascade down is just have a lot of helper functions. That's what I found. Um, so because I use this so much, it's like, well, go to Firebase, get the collection user with this ID. I made a helper function. Um, and then under that, I have a trigger collection and under the address. So I write that in. Um, and then after that, so this is where the back button comes in. Someone was asking about it. Um, so the way I use it is this material page root thing. So you can think of it like when you start activity, right? you're kind of pushing something onto the stack. And then when you finish your activity, you pop. So here, um, if it's the first time you're doing it, then I um, go ahead and push a replacement, meaning that I don't want to see this uh, address input screen anymore. Because after the first time, you will have to click on add edit button to come to this screen. And then when you're done, it pops back up. So that's the second case. If you are already have an existing address, then it kind of, it's like start activity for result. Like you start it, and then you pop it back. So this is how the navigation element is done. So I'm not directly manipulating the back button, which I don't do in Android anyway. So hopefully that answer one question. So then we transition here. You can see we can tr we transition into this voting profile um, widget, of course, because everything is a widget, which is the most complicated bit on this app. So it listens to two streams, which is why it's complicated. So the first stream that, okay, let me just, usually the way you read, it's like you read an Android program, you you, you go into it on create and, and start from there. So I usually read a dot program starting from build, is how you build a widget. And again, helper functions. So right now, all this has is an app bar, and I have the log out button. Again, a helper function. Um, just want to quickly show here. And the icon, I didn't have to provide any assets because Icons built in, there's so many of them. It's all the material icons. It's amazing. You're just kind of like auto-completing and trying all the things. I love it. And then I create the body. The body is a election stream. So it's a stream, which means that it's listening to Firebase. And, and whenever the uh, database has a change, it will update itself. And Firebase, the way it works is you write to the local database, it syncs to the remote. And when you write on the remote, it syncs to the local. So that's how Cloud Function uh, works. So you write something there, and then you do the thing. In Node.js, I'm learning yet another language um, in, in, in the cloud, and then writes to a location, which if you have a stream that's listening to it, then your UI updates. Then um, if it's successful, it has data, it will create the body. So let me show you the stream. Uh, so the election stream, this is the bit about the stream. So I'm listening to the collection called uh, elections upcoming, and I call it .snapshot, which means that I wanted to return a stream of document snapshots. 
So then th that means uh, the on the on this side of the you can see the demo. So the, the voting location that's uh, written by cloud function to to process this. Okay, so let me just get to how that. Okay, let me just do this again so that you can see. And this time I'm going to click on the sample, which is a sample election somehow somewhere in Kansas. It's not real, but at least it actually fills up fills in all the details, which is, makes it more interesting. So what you saw was that spinning thing when there's no data. And then once the data comes in on, on the server, it sinks down. And then it shows all the, all the results. Let me just find, no, not here. Sync. All right, so this is the, this is the part that took me a long time to figure out, just this whole async await business. So in Dart, when you have a function that you want to run in the background, you mark it async. So, well, if, if it's wrong, let me know, because this is literally what I figured out in like two weeks. Um, then inside the body, if you, if, you, if, there, if you are calling an async, if you're calling an async function, and you normally, if you don't put the keyword await, it will just go and fire off, and then your your program will continue to execute. So that's how you would like fire and forget. Essentially, you fire it, and then something happens. But if you actually want to pause execution until the result comes back, you say the word await. And if you want to use the keyword await, your whole function has to be async. So what it means is when I call this fetch function, I don't know where I call it. Come on, where do I call this? All right. So this is the interesting bit. So basically, I'm watching this user stream, which is the address stream. Right? Remember when I changed the address here? All these things have to be hooked up together. So what it does is when you when the user updates on the server, actually not necessarily on the server, because the way it works is I write to the local database first, right? So it's watching that local database and say, hey, the address changed. So what I'm going to do is I will take the, the object that's written and use the part that is keyed address. So let me just show you how the object looks like. It's because but this whole thing is, is an object, right? So I want just the field address. This one doesn't have anything, but most of it has more than one thing. So that's this map function. And then async map, meaning I'm running this fetch function uh, to transform this address into some other objects. And instead of map, it's async map because the operation happens on the back end because background because it's fetching information on the Google back end. So this is this Google Civic business where it's fetching the voter information. Uh, that's the API defined here, which I mean, it's not that interesting uh, in terms of reading documentation about what the what the object does but it returns a object that i can then use to render so i think that the the main the main takeaway for me is it's very different from what i do in android at least the way i hooked up with firebase because i i'm i'm thinking okay given this object so for me it's this object called voter info this given this object this is how the ui should look like and then that's it. So the UI doesn't really care about anything else. And what my job is, is to make that voter information contain the information that I need. So what that does is basically, I end up, I end up programming a lot more cloud function than Dart, to be honest, because all I am doing is really, it's like an inbox outbox. I'm like imagining this old style office when you have like a pile of dot, paper and then the boss signs it and then like put it on the outbox. That's how I've been using Firebase. So it just writes something and then somebody else is watching. So is there anything new? And then it grabs it and then it processes it and puts it and then something is watching. So the other thing that's watching is either and other cloud functions could have some cascading things going on or it's the UI. If it's the UI, then it's like, oh, okay, that's a new object. I'm going to render the UI. And I think Flutter is actually smart enough to do a dip first. So it like knows the previous state and the current state. So if you have a new object, then it's like, oh, you only change the star. 
let me show you the star. Oh, it's cool. So I have this star, which when I click on it, what it does is it writes to the local database and then it pushes out to the to Firebase. And then I tell, let me see, I tell here. I tell Flutter that set state. So this this one actually needs to be stateful because if I think because it's trying to change the the the, the UI. So I think of a uh, stateful versus stateless now. Um, it's like you do Android. It's like when you have a custom view, and you call invalidate. So when you call set state in the dot uh, in the front of it's like calling invalidate in Android. But you don't normally call that unless you have a custom view. Essentially, it took me a long time to uh, figure that out. Um, I don't even know whether I need this here. Um, but anyway, I like I said, this is a quote real project. I'm coding, uh, coding to a real backend. So I, I spent a lot of time massaging data. Um, so I, I would say that the Flutter part is actually the easy part. Once I go over the, the there are two main hurdles that I need to overcome. Like one is figuring out how to just do a plain old REST call. Like that, I was so spoiled by retrofit that was not obvious. And that was the first thing I tried to do. But so also trying to understand this whole async business. And um, I have to use a, um, a instead of a stream builder, it's like a future builder. So a future and a stream is kind of like uh, two very similar things. So a, a future is something that returns once in the future. A, a stream is something that returns in the future, but keeps coming. Um, I, that must be something equivalent in Rx Java. I don't know, so I cannot tell you. I understand it in, in, in the Dart world. Um, so that was one thing. And then, and then the other one was just really figuring out how to structure things so that the events are triggering in the right sequence. Because, because like I said, it was like input, input, output, right? So initially, I was writing to the same object, right? So the, when the address changed, it changes the same like voter profile. And then it was just like, wait a minute, this, like mentally, it was very difficult to keep track of. So like once I make that like breakthrough of like, okay, we are going to have something that reads and something that writes, and that's it. Like if you want a state change, you'll write on the request queue essentially. You say, okay, my address changed. So you just say my address changed, and nobody, nobody else is going to be writing to that except the app, right? And then the server takes the address and, um, and do something with it. Well, actually, in this case, it's not the server. It's the client that it takes the address, and then it, uh, it pings Google. It fetches all the uh, voting districts, and then it writes to another place. Let me show you. Um, so the app, what it does, the app watches this address object, and it does that fetch, the async fetch. Uh, I'll finish the sentence and I'll get to you. Um, and then it fetches the information and then it stores it in this object called civic info, uh, which is just with the, the straight JSON object, which then is like, oh, all these fields. Um, and then I massage it so that it's exactly what I want to present in the UI. And uh, there's a cloud function that writes it, then writes it in the elections upcoming object. And this object maps exactly to what I want to show on the UI. So the UI is really dumb, essentially. It, it's just like, oh, hey, I have a list of um, contests. So I will pick the name of the contest and put it into a list tile. And that's it. Question? Um, because my app design changed. I think in this particular case, it didn't need to, because initially I was, um, I was thinking, oh, everything, all the, all the logic can happen in the server, but I was too cheap to pay. If you want to call external service on the server on Firebase, you have to pay, or you have to set up a credit card at least. Uh, if you don't cross some like Delta, uh, uh, quota, you don't pay. Um, so in the end, I was running it on the client instead of on the server. Uh, but I'm, I'm just using the same mental model also because it's easy to manage. So it's like I'm watching whenever the address change, it's a stream because I'm writing it to, to Firebase, even though the server wasn't reading it. Like the, the local Firebase is changing. And when I subscribe it, to, it's, it's a stream. The UI knows to update. So this is not strictly necessary for the address part. Yeah. There were some hands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
deep breath because this is not retrofit. Like this is very tedious. So let's take a look. Um, then I'm using this library called Jaguar Serializer, oh, uh, which is here. Huh. All right. So first of all, it's not that bad in the sense that I don't have to actually step through all the JSON objects. So for example, like you can see what is the root object and one is like an embedded object. So for example, I have a division. So this one is just uh, primitive types, right? Just string, 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 string. Um, so that the Jaguar library can serialize for me automatically. Then the like you know uh, address is the same. That is a it's a kind of root type. But then when I have representative info, which contains an embedded address object, then I need to tell the serializer that. Hey, you know, I need you when you serialize this, you can get the address at serializer and the division serializer to help you. And this dollar business is the mixed in thing, which I don't understand what it is, but it's automatically generated. So, this is the actual code that does the serialization that translates between JSON and the dot objects. And this part is also generated. And to do that, you need to hop over to the terminal. And then run the build runner or something. I haven't done it on this computer. I usually um, program on Linux. So um, it's a command line tool that you have to run, which it's not bad, but it's pretty tedious. And it took me a while to figure out as well. Um, so the Jaguar serializer is the, the thing I, I'm using to generate the, the, the part that's in the dollar sign. Um, and then you have to. It doesn't even tell you that you have to run. Ah, uh, here, here. You have to run this in your command line. Um, and for me, I didn't realize that you cannot. You have to spell out all the dependencies by hand. Like if you have an embedded object inside, I wouldn't know. That. I don't know how to serialize it. So you have to build the whole tree. Once you figure out, it's like it's tedious, but it's not the end of the world. But so I have that. That is the JSON generation part. And since I'm in this folder, I'm also going to show you the other code gen, which is the retrofit thing. Like, how do you make REST calls? Um, so, this part is pretty familiar if you have done retrofit before. And the way I hook it up, let's see. So, this, um, I forgot how the serialization works. I think there's somewhere down here. I don't remember, but that's somewhere that, that hooks up the uh, the requests and the response to use the Jagger serialization. Uh, maybe it's here. Hmm. Sorry, that part I don't I don't remember where it is. But yeah, it's uh, it's available at least. Not, and like the official documentation was like, just roll it out by hand. Here, I have a map. And I'm like. Really? But on the other hand, I couldn't figure out how to do that on the Firebase side. So on the Firebase side, I am just using a map. Like I just get the map from the Firebase and just <laughs> stick my hand into the the object because um, like I just I just want to do, to get the MVP out. Um, but it's available. There are libraries and whatnot. Like that's kind of the state of Flutter in general. Um, I th it must be better than a year ago because there are these libraries, but it's not like mature. It, it has a lot of rough edges, a lot of verbosity. It gets the job done. At least, like you know, I didn't abandon my project after a week being too frustrated. It's actually very pleasant to work with, um, and I really like just kind of the, how modern it is, like the way you think about how to handle the data. Um, hey, yeah, I think that's what I wrote here, um, and then I wrote down list tile. I think I just want to show like a a, a built-in widget. Um, so you can see here on the okay. Let me let me just change the uh, change the address so that it shows you something different. Uh, so this is you see the voting location. Uh, it's it's just one list tile. Let me show you. So a list tile is one of the built-in objects. Um, initially, I thought you can only use it inside a list, but 
list you, but no, everything is a widget. So if you want to use this outside of a list, that's fine. Or if you want to put like any widget inside a list, that's fine too. But anyway, the list style is nice because it gives you a title um, and the subtitle. So this is the title and the subtitle and the icon. So this is all already done for you, uh, which um, is very nice. Like in, can you imagine in Android where you first of all have to do an adapter and then like for each item, I think there's one in the head, and then you have to like have the view holder and map things and whatnot. So here, you just say, oh, give me a list tab. I want this to be title, this to be the subtitle, and I want this icon, which is a map, which is built in, um, and then on press. Now, what I'm going to do is open map, and uh, the launch URL, I think that's a library. So a lot of things I'm pulling in libraries, but there are a lot of libraries available. Um, so just because it's fun, I'm going to click on this icon. And yay, it opens Google Maps. Um, so I don't have a map view built in because I, you know, that's too much work. <laughs> so I just have it launch an external one, which is that's the beauty of Android, right? Like, and I think you can do that on iOS too. I haven't figured out how to compile for iOS yet. That's a lot more on the Firebase end, but um, that I don't think I can ad lib. I, I will have to like, actually draw out a diagram of all the inbox and outbox and how the processing works. But that's also fascinating, like just because I'm learning JavaScript promises which is kind of like the async away stuff. But um, I don't think I actually wait. I just chain things together. And then I just keep chaining them. It's like, then this happened. And then um, anyway, so that's a different talk. Yeah. Would people be interested in seeing a more organized version of this? <laughs> OK. Um, how, how, like, which part should I talk more or less? Because I feel like right now I'm just showing you the painful bit because i thought if you're interested in doing this yourself you may want to know the pain that i went through so you don't have to go through it yourself like more how i construct the ui or more about the streams or more about the firebase stuff yeah I can quickly show you. I haven't I have, haven't done any global styling. The only global styling I've done is the material styling, which in main. This is literally the only global thing I've done, which is the material app. I give it a theme of purple because I like purple, and also purple is like not red and not blue, so you know, not choosing size. Um, and that's it. Like that's the yeah, I'm not choosing size. Um, that's the only theming I've done that's global. And I'm I'm not going to attempt the demo gods, so I'm not going to try to hot below this because I'm so tempted. Like, let me change it to yellow, but I don't want to break things. So I'm going to leave it. Um, but there are a lot of like kind of local styling that I've done. So again, I'm trying to get organized. So if, in the widget. Uh, thing I have this header so you can see here the voting address so that's that's one widget that is called a header that I put together it's more like a composite it's not really a custom view um, but you can see the styling that I'm doing is like first of all I fed I um, I I use we well, use the theme so when I ask for the primary color for the title text which is the voting address part that like is the dark purple. And I want to change it to be bigger, so I say 18, and then I want it to be bold. Uh, so it's like to create this text, you need the actual string and then a textile object, which I specify the color, the font size, and the font weight. You can specify other parameters as well. Um, and then, you know, if you give me a parameter for trailing, so here, um, there's a little kind of like name parameter trick. So um, because sometimes I don't care about whether there's a trailing icon or not. So like the ballot information one doesn't have a trailing text. It only has the title text. Um, so if there is one then I say, okay, I will make another one. This time I want it to be the style of primary color and 18, but not bold. And I want a padding of 16 around. So I don't actually know how to do global theming. So I just put everything in helper widgets. So this way, if I decided that, well, actually, I don't really like that the title is bold, I just change it here. And because I'm calling get header, 
everywhere, the whole app will change. Uh, that may be a better way of doing it, but this is just a poor man, poor woman's way of styling. Um, but I do definitely reuse the material theme. Yeah. Okay, so final plug. Um, if you want to help with the project, let me know. I have created issues. Um, probably most of you here don't have much Flutter experience except I um, So there are things I don't know how to do. Like, how do I even update the iOS icon? I don't know. Like, an, there's an iOS project down there somewhere. I need to do something with it. Um, I want to change the address to have the Google autocomplete, which I know that that's a library, but I don't have it time to figure that out because it's not on the critical path. I can still make it functional. Um, and so there are some other things that's more Firebase specific. Um, so if you want to contribute, like let me know or just pop onto the issues. Uh, but like don't don't just send me a pull request. Like start on the issue first because I may be working on it. So I don't want us to be stepping on each other's toes because I'm I'm like on a mad rush because I want this to be ready for the elections which this is not my full-time job, so I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, it's not going to be ready for, for the primary. I mean, that's next Tuesday. That's not happening. Uh, but for, for November, hopefully, because after the whole thing is done, I still need to populate it with the election data because the Google Civic API, although it sounds very amazing, um, the, the data, like, for example, for the primary election, so the screen you're seeing here, the voting location is from them, but they didn't have any contest information. So the, the other part, I'm actually merging it from Firebase from my own data. So I'm actually merging two data sources, which is why there's all this stream. And I have SIP, actually. That's the one concept I picked up from my RX Java. Um, so like, I would need to write tools to, like you can see, like bulk import into Firestore. So I want to have something that I can type into like a Google Sheet, like just the con candidate name, and like where the website is, and where the Instagram is, and whatnot. And then I can pump that into Firebase um, and then fetch it, depending on your district. Oh, no, so not necessarily district division. So, so essentially, I'm key, keying this. So I fetch it from Google and I say, oh, you are in Colorado Congressional District 4. That means that you are going to be voting for the Congressional District 4, and these are your candidates. Um, so that's a lot of work that needs to be done to make it functional because I need to have content. So it's like, the, so the coding part needs to be done way ahead of time. So anyway, thank you for listening. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, please come to Loveland. It's in, it's in two days. So this is the sign up page. Um, I have made the RSVP on our side zero people because I want everybody to sign up on the the Colorado, the Northern Colorado page, because that way we don't have to merge two streams of data. Ah, stream joke. Um, so I know it's a bit of a drive. So if people want to carpool, talk to each other. And I hope I didn't take up all the time because I do want to make sure that people who are interested in getting jobs, you know, can talk to people who are hiring and whatnot. So thank you. Yeah.